Jubilee, good morning. Can everybody hear me? If you can hear me, wave your hands. Let me see. All right. What's up, Jubilee? Good morning. How we doing this morning? Good, good. Okay. Well, I want to I want to call our attention to the book of Psalms, chapter number 73, for our call to worship. This this text is addressing our hearts to prepare to magnify, magnify our God. And it starts off with a very important statement here. Give me one second. I lost my page. Psalm 73, starting in verse number 25. I'm going to read down to verse number 29. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Though my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of your works. Let me invite you to stand to your feet as we now worship the one of whom we say, there is no good in heaven or in earth beside him. Let's worship. Good morning, Jubilee. Let's sing How Firm a Foundation, the Saints of the Lord. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, he is laid for your faith in his excellent word.
You may have a seat. <clears throat> Two words for you as we start this morning, satisfaction and rest. Can somebody say satisfaction? And rest, say rest. How many of y'all know our days are spent in pursuit of satisfaction and rest? And that is absolutely the case because we were, we were made for it. We were created for satisfaction. We were created for rest. Um, and yet, what we always have to remember, at least what I have to remind myself, is that both of these things, satisfaction and rest, were not made for me, right? Satisfaction and rest don't find their, their terminus in me. They don't find the end of the road in me. Right? Satisfaction and rest point to another individual. It points to another one in whom our satisfaction and rest is found. I was reminded of this this past weekend freshly because I heard again two statements that in the past captured my heart when I first heard them, and they typically capture my heart every time I hear them, and I pray that it would capture your heart, whether if you're hearing them for the first time or if you're hearing them for a number of times, it would still do the same type of work. The first statement comes from Pastor John Piper where he says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. I remember the day that I heard that and how that arrested my attention, and it, it, it caused me to think about what he was saying. Uh, God gets the glory to the degree that my satisfaction and gladness and joy is in him. And the second statement comes from Augustine, this African church father uh, that, that has blessed the, the, the church in so many ways. But he says this in his book, uh, Confessions, in the first, the first chapter. He says, speaking to God in prayer, he says, you have made us for yourselves, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Satisfaction and rest. We, we are made for the Lord and our hearts will continue to search in restlessness until it rests and finds its, 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 its joy in the one of whom it was made for. Now in, in our plan, when we put together our sermon card today, we were supposed to be in Psalm 14. But in the Lord's plan, this morning, we're going to be addressed from his word from Psalm 16. And we'll do Psalm 14, Lord willing, later on this month. And in Psalm 14, I think there are verses here that speak to us on satisfaction and rest. So I, I want us to pray this morning, and I want us to ask the Lord, first of all, to satisfy us with himself and to give us the rest that our hearts yearn for and are restless until we find, once again, our rest in him. And I want us to ask that the Lord to open up our eyes to see wonderful things out of his word today, that as we travel through Psalm 16, we'll deeply see uh, these things that our hearts yearn and long for. Every last one of us came here this morning yearning for satisfaction and looking for rest. And I'm glad to tell you this morning that we have so in our good, our good Father. Amen? So let's pray to that end. Uh, Father, before we ask you for anything, I, I stand, we stand in front of you. We gather in your presence just to give you adoration and praise and to magnify you as the one in whom our satisfaction is found. The one in whom is glorified rightly when we are satisfied in you. The one in whom rest could happen, Father. You look for satisfaction um, in no place in this universe. You don't search for rest. That is all found within yourself. And Father, we magnify you as being the one today who is all sufficient. So be exalted in our praise today. Be lifted up and magnified in worship today. And, oh, Father, be lifted up and magnified in our need of you. So as we gather today as a body, as a community of saints who by your grace have looked upon your son, has trusted in his sufficiency, trusted in his goodness, seen his beauty and seen his glory, Father, would we be a satisfied people today? Would we be satisfied in the work that you've accomplished for us in your son? And would you get glory from that also? And Father, would we be a people at deep rest in a world that is unrestful, Father? We come in this morning with all type of things that are attacking the rest of our hearts. Oh, Father, would you meet us in ways that cause us to be at peace with you, to find our refuge in you. So, Father, once again, be exalted. Be exalted in every aspect of this service. And, oh, Father, would you um, continue to work in us that which is well-pleasing in your sight. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. A couple of announcements for you all. If you're a guest here, thank you so much for joining us this morning here at Simply Park. 
I want to direct your attention to our website for further information, uh, www.jubileeminneapolis.org. Uh, there you'll be able to find a little bit more information about us, but you also can fill out a first time visitor or guest form there and you'd be able to uh, request some information from us, let us know who you are, and we'd reach out to you. If you have any questions or if you need anything, we have some ushers that are posted in various spots around the park here, and we have some these nice little cool orange or yellow orange, whatever color this is, lanyards on. So look out for somebody with a lanyard if you have any questions, and we'd love to be able to assist you in any way that we, that we can. I want to put two dates on your calendar, August 29th, is our next Get to Know Jubilee class. So if you're interested in coming to know a little bit more about Jubilee, what we're about, ask us some questions, get to know us, we get to know you, think about what it looks like to be a member at Jubilee. We'd love for you to sign up for that class. Once again, you can email us, family at jubileeminneapolis.org if you plan on attending. And that's gonna be from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. And then the next day, I just wanna read this to you, on August the 30th, we're going to have an event that is going to remind us of a really special ministry that we had. Let me just pull it up and read to you the details of this announcement. So on August the 30th, we want you to join us at the service for a time of encouragement and a presentation from the Read Hope Project. This Read Hope Project is going to point into some good things here. And then we want to hear from also a testimony from the Onions and how the Lord has been working much grace in their lives and then get some updates on our foster care lead team and discuss some ways to get involved. So once again, that's going to be on August 30th, right after our service here. Feel free to bring your own blankets and chairs and, and masks and all of that good stuff. And feel free also to bring some individual package snacks for you to enjoy. We'll have some here and some water available. So those are two dates that I want to put in your, in your mind. Well, as we, as we move on in our service, we always take a, a period of time to not only be addressed by God through his word, and not only to address him in songs, but also to address him concerning the state of our, our hearts. We, we come in as those who have not done everything right this week. We've come in this service as those who have not loved God the way we ought to have loved God and loved our neighbors and our family members and, 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 and brothers and sisters as we have ought to do so. And yet, so this, this time in the service is a wonderful opportunity to talk to the Father who sits on a throne of grace that is uh, packed with mercy and grace to help in time of need and to ask him to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness and to forgive us of our sin. Uh, so to that end, let me read to you for our benefit, for our faith, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, down to chapter 2, verse number 2. And I want you to hear this with ears of faith as we direct our attention to the one of whom we say is perfect and holy and yet yearns to dwell in the midst of a people who uh, in our sin need uh, cleansing so that he would be pleased uh, amongst us. So 1 John chapter 1. Listen to what he says in verse number five. This is the message that we heard from him, Christ, and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is that good news to anybody in this park this morning? He's faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. So this morning, let me point your attention to the one who is faithful and just to forgive sins. And in light of this good word, let's direct our prayers to him and ask him to do exactly what he's promised to do. Take a few minutes to pray, and then I'll draw us together here in a couple of minutes 
and pray and lead us on to the next part of our worship service. Oh, Father, who, who shall sojourn in your tent and who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his and her heart, who does not slander with his or her tongue and does not do evil to his or her neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his or her friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised but who honors those who fear the Lord. Father, these are the ones who are able to dwell in the midst of your presence in your holy tent, as the psalmist has said. And yet we come in knowing, Father, that this is not our story. We come in, Father, with unclean hands and unclean hearts and thoughts, Father, that have not honored you. We come in this morning, Father, with words that have been sharp towards one another, with actions that have not demonstrated a sacrificial love towards one another. We readily acknowledge, Father, that we have not lived in ways that glorify you, and yet we doubly readily acknowledge that there is forgiveness found with you. You are faithful and just to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. So, Father, we, in light of your mercy, in light of your goodness, we confess our sin to you and repent. And ask for you to forgive us and cleanse us. And, Father, to wash consciences clean and to remove all barriers in front of us, Father, that would keep us from further worshiping you today. Father, we are glad this morning to sing of a God who is faithful and just. And it's in the name of your Son and it's by the work of your Son that we bank on that promise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, Jubilee, I told you I was going to read 1 John 2, uh, 1 John 1. Uh, verse number five down to chapter two, verse number two. Let me read to you chapter two, verse number one and two. As that which is good news to your soul this morning, this gospel proclamation, this assurance of what we have just done here. He goes on to say, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Is anybody in here trusting in Jesus this morning? Three of y'all. How many of y'all are trusting in the Lord this morning? Right? Trusting in Jesus this morning. You know who you're trusting in? You're trusting in the one who is called Jesus Christ the righteous, the advocate that you have with the Father, whose work is perfect for the salvation of your soul, and the forgiveness of your sin. If that doesn't make you happy, nothing on this planet will make you happy. Amen? <laughs> Let me invite you to stand to your feet as those who in Christ have been forgiven of sin and whose consciences are clean by the blood of Christ. And let's worship as those who are forgiven in Jesus. Souls 
to another Give us clean hands Give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls to another We bow our hearts We bow our hearts We bend our knees Oh Spirit, come make us humble We turn our eyes from evil things, O oh Lord, we cast down our idols, give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another, give us clean hands. sorrows what a name for the son of god who came ruined sinners to reclaim again when he comes our glorious king
Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all. all right, let's sing that again. What did our Savior say to us, Lord? I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain it white as snow pray together. Mm -hmm. 
Father, we're so thankful this morning that we are children of God because of the work that you've done through Jesus Christ. We're thankful that we're sustained not by our own ability to keep up with you, but by your Spirit who continues to work in us to bring about in and through us the changes that you have designed, that you desire for us as families, as, as a church family, and as we interact with our city, our country, our world. Oh, Father, our desire is that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done and that, that through our lives, others would find the peace that we are, that we are learning is what this life is all about. And so this morning we ask on behalf, not only of our own lives, not only of our own families, but we ask on behalf of our city, our cities and our state. And we ask, oh Lord, would you bless, would you bring what is needed in order that we as a people might live in prosperity. Not necessarily the prosperity of, of stuff, but the prosperity of peace, the prosperity of justice, the prosperity of righteousness, the prosperity that comes when you dwell in our midst. So Father, we thank you this morning. Even as we pray for our city, we thank you that you want to use us. You've, you've given us life and you've given us breath today in order that through our lives we might bear witness to you, to your presence, to your work, to the truth that it is God who has caused the sun to rise. It's God who has caused the grass to be green. It's God who is at work to will and to do according to your good pleasure. And so, Father, we just want to be a people submitted to you as we live and as we move and as we carry out the purposes that you have for our lives. You know our hearts. You know our lives. We've already spent time just confessing before you our sin. Father, help us to forgive one another. As you have forgiven us, now would you help us to forgive one another? I would ask that, that Father here you would teach us, even this morning, through this psalm that we are going to study, you would teach us not to hold grudges, not to judge one another, but like our Lord, to forgive. Like our Lord, to, to so use these lives that others are served by every word that comes from our mouth, by by every um, action that we do with our lives. We want to be a people who serve like our Lord, who didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give His life. Oh, Father, we want to do that with these lives that You've given to us. So, Father, You know the, the needs of, of our family members who are around the world who are seeking to bear witness to your name and we just ask that you would strengthen them, that you would guard them and protect them. You know the needs that we have as family members right here. There are some who are sick. There are some who need jobs. Father, we ask that you would take care of us as your people, that you would provide for us as your people. And Father, you know the need that we have to be men and women of the word, for our children to grow up just loving the gospel, loving the truth of this, of this gospel that we're going to study in a few moments. And so we ask, oh Father, would you by the power of your Spirit cause us to treasure, to treasure this gospel message, this truth that sets us free, this truth that is the way to the Father. Would you do that, Father? Would you so work in our lives? Would you work in our families? Cause your word to run and to be glorified through the, the lives and the witness of Jubilee Community Church. And so now we pray for Toph as he's going to bring the word. A little out of season, but I just pray that, that uh, as he wasn't 
thinking that this would be his week, that you have uniquely prepared him for this week. And we trust that you will now open our, our hearts, our minds, our ears to receive and give us understanding that our lives might be better prepared for the week that you have for us, the week that's ahead of us. So we just commit ourselves afresh to you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to invite you to turn to Psalm chapter 16. Again, as uh, Lewis told us, is, uh, we'll be coming back to Psalm 14 and 15. But uh, Psalm 16, and I'll just read this passage for us. It's a victim of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to Yahweh, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Morning, Jubilee. One of my favorite movies is Batman, The Dark Knight Rises. I love how in the middle of the movie, Bruce Wayne, the coolest guy in the world, is stuck in this pit. And it looks like there's no way for him to get out. He has a broken back of all things, but he goes into hard training. He starts working. And meanwhile, the whole city of Gotham is in flames. The whole city that Bruce Wayne loves is falling apart at the hands of the villain, Bane. And so it looks absolutely hopeless for the city of Gotham. You see the, the police are, are kept in the sewer systems. They, they don't have any protection for the city and it looks absolutely hopeless. Batman is nowhere to be seen. And the people who love their city, who love Gotham, are still going to fight for it because they are loyal to their city. And they're, they're going to keep and stay protecting their city even though they know that this villain Bane is going to overpower them. However, at just the right moment, Bruce Wayne escapes from the pit. And after he escapes from the pit, he puts on his Batman suit and he enters into the city without any of the people knowing that he's back and you can see them fighting wearily in the streets and then all of a sudden they look up and they see Batman and the whole crowd cheers and they delight in Batman and they love it and and I cry every time I watch that <laughs> much to my wife's chagrin because she said I didn't cry on my wedding day but I cry in Batman I don't know why the reason we love stories like that is because whoever rescues us from danger, in them we find delight. The people of Gotham were in extreme danger, and because Batman <laughs> saved them, they delighted in their hero. And what we're going to see this morning in Psalm 16 is that God delivers us from danger so that we might delight in Him. 
God delivers us from danger and even puts us in dangerous situations so that we might delight in Him. Well, Psalm 16 is a song of confidence. It's a song of delight in our sovereign Lord's ability to protect us. And what a comforting this word is for us today. As so many things around us feel chaotic, we can have perfect protection under the mighty hand of our sovereign Lord. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 16. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4 first. And what we see in these first four verses is that the psalmist moves from danger to delight. Verse 1, he says, Preserve me, O God. You don't ask God to preserve you when you're just having a little bit of a hard circumstance. You ask for God to preserve you when you are in dire straits. When it looks like your life is all but over. It's at that point that you plead with God simply to preserve your life. So the psalmist is in a really dangerous situation. His life is at stake. And he says, preserve me, O oh God. For, because I take refuge in you. So the psalmist is saying, look God, answer my prayer because I'm not self-sufficient. I'm not turning to man. I'm not turning to the government for this problem. I'm turning to you alone, God. I am renouncing my self-sufficiency, so please answer my prayer. Because God loves to answer prayers of people who know they're not self-sufficient. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. Now what is a refuge? A refuge is a place that you run to because there's nowhere else in the planet that you can run and be safe. A refuge is somewhere where you run because you know on your own there's no way you can stand within the dangerous spot that you're in. We felt a little bit of this in Minneapolis on Friday night when the tornado sirens went off. We all went down to our basement to find shelter. Well, my, my wife grew up in Oklahoma, and she said at least one time a summer, the tornadoes would come, and immediately they knew they were not self-sufficient in, in the face of a tornado, and so they ran to a place of refuge underground, a storm shelter. Well, God is saying this morning that He wants to be our storm shelter. He wants to be the refuge where... He is the only place where we find our protection. Listen to Psalm 144 and its description, its beautiful description of all the ways that God protects us. So if you're bringing in fear this morning, fear about a job, fear about your house, fear about a relationship, let these words land on you in the power of the Holy Spirit. David, David says to God, you are my rock. You are my fortress, my stronghold, and my deliverer. God, you are my shield, and he in whom I take refuge. What a list of the massive protection of God that he offers us in our lives. Verse 2, the psalmist says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. So what happens is, the psalmist is in danger. He runs to God as his refuge, and then immediately he erupts into worship and delight because of God's control of his life. Because in a unique and special way, when he was in danger and he ran to God, he knew at that moment that God alone is my sovereign Lord in whom I take refuge. So he says to God, you are my sovereign Lord. That's not just kind of a mental assertion, you are my sovereign Lord. It's more of an eruption like I would say to Amy after we're married, you are my wife and I love it and I would have it no other way. The psalmist is saying, you are my Lord. You are the sovereign Lord who led Egypt 
out of the wilderness or led Israel out of the wilderness. You protected them. You are my Lord and I would have it no other way. And I love it. So what we see here is as the psalmist is clinging to God in desperation, it allows him to experience God's complete rule in his life. And then, at that point, he recognizes that he has no good apart from God. So when we cling to God is our only refuge. It's, it's at that point where we truly understand his lordship in our life, and we truly, finally get it that our only good comes from him. God, I have no good apart from your sovereign lordship in my life. So God delivers us from danger so that we might delight in him. Verse 3 says, As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. So delight in God turns into delight for his people. So if you're someone who says, I delight in my God, a barometer, if that's actually true or not, is if you're delighting in his people. Even the ones who are different than you, even the ones who have different convictions than you, because you delight in God, you also delight in his people. And I think, I think the reason we delight in one another, partly, is because we have a shared experience of being delivered by God. We have a camaraderie together of being delivered by the Almighty God. Verse 4, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their name on my lips. So when we cling to God as our refuge and find our delight in Him, it means we will also turn and hate all of His competitors. All the idols in our life that promise protection, but they never deliver us. They never deliver us. So Jubilee, I ask this morning, do you run to other people hoping that they can be your own personal Messiah? Do you run to entertainment hoping to numb your troubles away? Do you run to a substance trying your best to turn off the pain? Are you tempted to run to food or sex, fighting pain with pleasure? Our hearts are always grasping after idols because we feel insecure. And what this passage teaches us is, if we turn to these things, they will only multiply our sorrow. The idols we're so prone to cling to only promise us more pain and more sorrow. In fact, that sorrow multiplies. So Jubilee, let us turn to God alone as our sovereign king, our refuge. Let's not make any other storm shelters in our life except for God Almighty. God delivers us from danger so that we might delight in him. Verses 5 and 6. Taking refuge in God gives us contentment. I love these verses. By the way, this is one of the most amazing psalms in, 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 the, in the whole book of psalms. And, and part of the reason is the way it expresses delight in God makes you infatuated with Him. It, it, it stir, stirs up your heart to affection. We see this in, in verse 5 where it says, The Lord, or Yahweh, is my chosen portion and my cup. Well, we, read, we read that today and we're like, what? Well, chosen portion is referring to the best part of an animal in a sacrifice. And that was the part that was given to the priest to eat. So that would have been like the filet mignon. Picture yourself super hungry after church today. Let's say you miss breakfast and you go to your favorite steakhouse if you eat steak or your favorite vegan restaurant if you do that. 
And think about mouth-watering filet mignon, cooked just perfectly, and, and everything about it is perfect, and you take that first bite. That's what the psalmist is saying the presence of God is like to his soul. God alone is his satisfaction. And the same is said when he says, you are my cup. In scripture, a cup is what holds blessing. It's the liquid that sustains life. It quenches our thirst. And so we come to God because our souls are famished. And our longing hearts are always grasping after security. And it's so easy to do it with things in this world, things that we feel will protect us. And yet we learn here that God alone is a satisfaction for our famished souls. God alone is the satisfaction for our famished souls. And you see this all over the Psalms. Listen to Psalm 73, 25. The psalmist says, Whom have I had in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail in fear, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We were made for God. We were made to sit under his shade of his protection. And that's the only place where our souls will find sweet rest and delight. But we not only have delight in God, we also have contentment in our circumstances. You see that in the last part of verse 5. It says, you hold my lot. In other words, God is in control of all we have. This is talking about the allotment that God gave the different tribes of Israel when they inherited the promised land. God's the one who divided up who went where. God's the one who decides what your love life looks like. God's the one who ultimately decides your children. God's the one who, who picks out the car you're going to drive, who, who shows you where to live, what church you go to. God is the one who holds your lot. That should give us deep security. God is the one who has us exactly where we are. And that's a beautiful thing. Listen to the psalmist rejoice in all that God has given him. He said, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Taking refuge in God gives you delight in what, you, what he gives you. Do you see that there? He knows it's God who gives him everything he has. And he sees it as pleasant and beautiful because he's taking refuge in God. Why is that? I think it's because when you're taking refuge in God, you don't need to run to idols for security. When you're taking refuge in God, you're not running after other things in your life to be satisfied and feel secure. One example of this would be money. Hebrews 13 says this. It says, keep your life free from the love of money. And at this point, you think the author of Hebrews would say, because God is more delightful. But he doesn't say that. It says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. So why do we pursue money and the things that money can buy? Because we're afraid. Why do we pursue idols in our life and in, in where we live or, or what our love life looks like? Because we're afraid. We're afraid that if we don't have this thing, that our life will be over. And God wants us to move past that and recognize that in Him alone we can delight because He alone is our refuge. So Jubilee, what is it this morning that you fear? And who is it that you're running to with that fear? Is it to God? If so, then your delight will be in Him. 
But if your fear is driving you to other people, other things, then your delight will be there. Whatever we take refuge in, in that we delight. God delivers us from danger, so we delight in Him. I think we've all experienced times where we're afraid. I'm about to tell you a time when I was really afraid in my life. I've always been an anxious person. You could ask my mom. Ever since I was a little boy, I heard Simeon went to camp this week and he had a great time and it, it reminded me of times when I was his age and I went to camp and I, I just couldn't eat like the day before because I was so anxious and scared to go. So that's been my whole life basically. And yet there's something that God teaches you in that and that, that he alone is, is our refuge. But one of the things we need so desperately when we find ourselves in distress, in danger, is guidance, right? One of the hardest things when you're walking through something that is tearing apart your soul in fear is that you don't know what to do. You still have to make decisions. God says he's going to protect you, but you, that doesn't mean you have to stop making decisions. And that's where the psalmist says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. So some of the folks here have been wondering, okay, the exact spot I live in the city, it's been tough. I don't know what, what God's calling me to do. The confidence we have here is that he will lead you. As you take refuge in him, it will be plain what you should do. And so, so often we, we tend to add to our worry upon worry because not only are we in a dangerous situation, but we don't know what we're supposed to do. But if we quiet our hearts as we take refuge in God, He gives us the counsel that we need to make decisions that honor Him. Verse 8, He says, I've set the Lord always before me. Because He's at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. So there is something we need to do when we're facing our fear. And that's we are supposed to set the Lord always before us. Let's let the plane fly over. up in the morning there's a lot of stuff that comes to the forefront of our mind the circumstance that we're so dreading is usually the first thing that we think about when we wake up what are my parents going to say about this where is this relationship really going to end up what about my job and it's at that moment where we have to remember to always set the Lord in front of us instead of our circumstances our hearts are always trying to gain the attention of our minds to think about what most makes us afraid and the psalmist says the way to fight that is to always put the Lord before you. So when you wake up, do you put the Lord in front of you? Do you read his word? Do you think, do you think about him? Do you pray? Do you, do you always put him in front of you just as you would anything that you have to give your attention to? And then he says, because God is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Now, what's it mean for God to be at his right hand? It means God's his right hand man. God is his Samwise Gamgee. Remember Samwise Gamgee? Frodo is going to Mordor, Mordor, the most dangerous place in the world. And I remember there's one instance in the book where Frodo says, go back, Sam. I'm going to Mordor alone. He doesn't want to bring his friend with him because of the danger. And you know what Sam, his right hand man said? Of course you are, and I'm coming with you. Nothing Frodo did could keep Sam, Samwise Gamgee away from him because Sam was his right-hand man. You don't leave someone if you're the right-hand man. Well, this verse is saying that God is our right-hand man. He's always with us. When you go into work tomorrow, you have a right-hand man. 
You have a sovereign, omnipotent Samwise Gamgee to help you just when you need it. And the promise is that you won't be paralyzed by fear. If you put the Lord before you tomorrow, this week, you will not be shaken. Shaken to the core in deep disquiet. You may have feelings of fear at times, but that fear won't drive your decisions. That's what it means not to be shaken. I remember one time where I felt very shaken was when, it was, when I first led Say Yes. Say Yes is an after-school program this was probably 12 years ago. I never get afraid anymore like this. Actually, I do all the time. But um, we, had, we had the youth coming. I'm fresh out of seminary. They don't, have, they don't have classes on this. And there's a fight between the youth. And it's because of two rival gangs. And this is happening in our church building. And people from these gangs are wanting to come into the building so the whole thing will erupt. And so we keep everyone from coming in. And then there are people circling around the building giving us this. Basically promising that they'll bring their weapons next time. Well, you can imagine where my soul was the next Wednesday night when we had Say Yes. I remember sitting in Stewart parking lot thinking, God, Please, I don't want to do this. I will do any other ministry except this. Please, I'll go back to leading the singles ministry that I destroyed at Bethlehem. <laughs> I did not want to do this. And so what I did is I looked to all my props that I usually go to. All right, I'm going to have Chuck Stenham come, all the pastors, and then, then it'll feel a lot safer and it won't all be on me. Well, one after another said they couldn't come. And it just felt like God was saying, Toph, I'm going to be your right-hand man tonight, and that's enough. And I went, and I could tell you there is a sweet joy and delight in God's presence like I haven't experienced. Because when God puts us in dangerous situations, he does it so that our delight will be in him and not in all the idols that we're so tempted to cling to. God delivers us from danger so we delight in him. Verses 9 and 11. What's the end result of making God your refuge? If today God is stirring up your heart afresh to find your refuge in Him alone, what can you trust will happen? What will your life look like? Well, it won't mean that He takes the dangers away, but it does mean He'll give you the good life, which is a life filled with His presence. Verse 9 says, Therefore my heart is glad. And my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. Now someone who, who doesn't have faith would have gone through a dangerous situation and said, I'm done with God. Why did you even have me go through this? I got go, I gotta go meditate on how I can make myself safer. He doesn't do that. He rejoices in his God who's his protector. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. God is giving him comfort from the inside out and the outside in. For you will not abandon my soul to shale or let your Holy One see corruption. So what we see is the psalmist ends confidently with the crescendo of joy-filled assertions. And essentially, it's the logic of faith. He looks at his life and he says, every time I put my trust in you, God, you delivered. Every time I was on the brink, you came through. And if that's the case, how can you not do that when I enter into death? This God has been so faithful. He has been such a rock to me that even in the grave, I can trust him. That's where the logic of his faith brings him. Verse 11, he says, you make known to me the path of life. 
In your presence, there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And again, the logic of faith is at work here. If God has given me such joy and pleasure in this life, even in the midst of danger, then how much more will that joy erupt into eternal pleasure in His presence forever? And this logic of faith has then been proven in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the forerunner, and He's the, the ultimate author of this psalm. The confidence we see in the psalm is the confidence that drove Jesus Christ to the cross that drove him right into the place of danger and then through the resurrection brought him to eternal joy with his father. And Jesus now is calling us to do that. And Jesus has become confident on our behalf. Peter quoted verses 8 and 11 of this psalm in his sermon on the day of Pentecost. Paul did the same. So when we read these verses, they are ultimately pointing to Jesus. And it's to Him alone that we ultimately run this morning. Jubilee, don't run to other gods. Don't go other places. It's so tempting in a season of unrest and chaos when our culture feels on edge to run anywhere but God. Always set the Lord before you. So, what will be the end result of us doing this? Well, we get a glimpse of it in Revelation. If we make God our refuge, if we run to Jesus, this is what we have to look forward to. These are the ones who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in the temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Can you imagine that? Just like those trees are sheltering you from the sun, there will be a day in heaven where the actual presence of God is sheltering you from everything and anything you could ever fear. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. God will satisfy all your deepest desires in ways you can't even imagine. Four, the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Jubilee, that is our glorious hope that God is speaking to us this morning that it might propel us out to love our neighbors in faith. This hope should so shape us that others see that our delight is in other things that protect us. They're running to everything else except God. And we want to show them a different way. One application of making God the only good in our life would be prayer and fasting on Mondays for the next three Mondays. We're going to set aside food, something we usually run to. And instead, we're going to give up food and pray on behalf of our city. We love Minneapolis. We, this is our home. This is a beautiful city. And there have been things happening that have been hard. And we want to be in the city. And we want to be fighting in faith for the city. And so what better way can we do that by drawing near to our refuge and pleading on behalf of the city? So for the next three Mondays, we're going to set aside food in whatever way God is guiding you. And we're going to pray with the Monday night prayer team and plead with God on behalf of our city that they might know that there's a different refuge than the Republican or Democratic Party. There's a different refuge and it's God alone let's pray father thank you so much that you are our refuge to whom we can run Lord don't allow us to run anywhere else except for you and we pray this in Christ's name amen
God delivers us from danger so that we may delight in Him. Jubilee, we this morning have gathered, first of all, with this call to worship. We answered the call to worship to come together as God's people to magnify His name. We have gone through a season of asking the Lord to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. We've sung songs to Him to magnify His word. And we have now just been addressed by his word, his word that reminds us of wonderful, wonderful things. So now Jubilee, it's time to go. It's time to go back into our neighborhoods. It's time to go back into our families, into our workplaces, into friends and other loved ones' lives. It's time to go back to these places and amongst these loved people with the hope and with the joy and with the contentment that we I just heard God address us from Psalm 16, all because of what Jesus Christ has done. So let me invite you to stand to your feet as we get ready to go. And I want you to hear this word of benediction right from this psalm. It's my prayer jubilee, the prayers of your pastors who, who in such deep joy love you all and want to see you continue to grow in Christ's likeness. So I pray that this week, you would set before you the Lord always. At Jubilee this week, you would know that he is the one at your right hand, and therefore, come what may this week, you will not be shaken. So as you go, may you go today with hearts that are glad, with whole beings that are rejoicing, and your whole life knowing that you are dwelling securely in Christ. Uh, go this week knowing that we've been commissioned by our good, our good Savior to preach the gospel. And go this week loving one another in sacrificial ways. In Jesus' name, pronounce this word of blessing and benediction over you. In all agreement, let the church say amen, amen, and amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for leading us well. Okay, sir. This is my first time trying to lead outside. It's interesting, isn't it?